in the sense that we, uh, our earlier efforts uh, were focusing on uh, work of many of the researchers within the university, uh, cutting across a number of fields. Uh, we then moved from that to looking at undergraduate life, and now we're turning to the library. I'm very happy to have join us today, Sam Besson, the assistant cur curator of the Levy Collection at Johns Hopkins University's libraries. Uh, Sam will, will talk us through uh, how, you know, how these collections come to be, how they arrive uh, within uh, the university, and then how really they connect uh, both to researchers within the university, but then are shared back out uh, more broadly to the world. Uh, along the way, I'm sure Sam will share a little bit about how he got involved in this and, and such. Uh, so Sam, thank you for joining us. Uh, i turn this over to you. All right, thanks so much, Simeon. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Simeon said, I'm Sam. I work for the University Libraries, and we'll be chatting today a bit about the university's uh, special collections. Uh, and as Simeon mentioned, we're going to be using the Q&A function today, uh, but also so that I can hear some thoughts from all of you. Uh, so let's test it out. Let's, everybody, if you could uh, open up the Q&A, and if you could type in your favorite, uh, let's say your favorite book. Uh, and if you don't have a favorite book, perhaps uh, a book that you are interested in reading or a book that you, you've heard of. All right. Lord of the Rings, I like that. All right, looks like the chat is working great. Jane Eyre, To Kill a Mockingbird, fantastic, great. Uh, so yeah, we'll be using the chat a couple of different times today. Um, and then feel free to type in any questions that you have, and we will get to those at the end. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that I promise I will not ask a question that has a wrong answer. There will be no incorrect answers today. So within the libraries, I am in the special collections department. Uh, and a question that I get asked fairly often is what actually is a special collection? What makes a collection special? Uh, and there's really no real definition of a special collection. Um, but generally, we are talking about, uh, you know, collections, groups of objects. Uh, and I say objects because we have much more than just books here, but items that are uh, rare, valuable, old, likely fragile, but generally items that have a significant value. Uh, and unlike the rest of the library, the items that we work with here in special collections are called non-circulating. Uh, they do not circulate. You can't check them out and take them home. If you want to look at them or study them, you have to do it under our close supervision. Uh, but something I was told when I first started here, which was actually in January, uh, that has really stuck with me is that we at Special Collections are not a museum. In a museum, everything is, of course, behind glass, cannot be touched by the public, and you would probably be yelled at by a security guard if you tried to touch something. Whereas our goal is access. We want and we encourage people to use and interact with our collections uh, and we'll actually give you some quick training on how to do it safely. So for example, uh, most of the time we do not wear gloves in special collections, which surprises a lot of people. You can see this researcher here is uh, reading a book from looks like the 17th or 18th centuries and she's not wearing gloves. Uh, now while gloves do protect objects from the oils that are in our hands that can damage them, they actually make it harder to use uh, and turn pages of old books uh, because we lose a lot of the, the really great senses that we have in our fingertips. So you can imagine trying to turn the page of any book with your, just your fingertips versus wearing gloves. Uh, so we've actually found that gloves make it easier to damage items. So to get around that, we just wash our hands before we are touching delicate or old objects. And we keep really close track of how often they're used to make sure they're not being damaged over time. So you can also see in this photo that there is foam padding under the book to provide support so that the spine of the book doesn't weaken. Um, the main rule I was actually told in working with old books or really any books that you would like to last a while uh, is to not just let it open up all the way. Uh, and you'll find if you take really any hardcover book and you start to open the cover, you'll find sort of a point of uh, resistance. And once we find that point of resistance on an old book, we will stick some foam padding under there so that the spine of the book does not have to do any work. Uh, and then within special collections, we also have the university archives, which more specifically consist of uh, historic records that are related to the university itself. So as I mentioned, I was hired in January. Uh, my background is actually in music, uh, and I run a sheet music collection here. So my background was in performing, reading sheet music, uh, putting on public programs. So 
I'm a bit rare in the libraries in that I don't actually have a degree in museum studies or library science. Um, but I am still even learning about the extent of our special collections because there are just so many of them. But I can share uh, at least two of my favorite collections with you. Uh, my first favorite is a collection of books that have what are called four edge paintings. Uh, these paintings are on the side of the book. Uh, if you can see my cursor, it's kind of the side right here near where this researcher's right hand is. And these paintings cannot be seen when the book is closed. They can only be seen when it's open and when the pages are being held at the perfect angle. So here is one of those paintings. Uh, and this is a painting of some witches sort of flying around a campfire. Here's another neat one here of characters from Winnie the Pooh. Uh, and here's a, a very large one with, you can see William Shakespeare on the left there uh, and some old looking cottage here. So these are, are really, really interesting books. Uh, and then the second collection, I will admit I'm slightly biased towards because it's the one that I was hired specifically to study. Uh, and that is the Lester Levy Sheet Music Collection. Uh, this is a collection of about 30,000 songs that were mostly published in the United States, some of them in London, and they go back to the late 1700s. So you can really follow all of US history through, uh, through these songs. Now, uh, a second question that I get pretty often is how are our special collections stored? Uh, there are countless items in our special collections. They're probably in the hundreds of thousands, if not in the millions. So where do we keep all of this stuff? Um, they're actually stored all over the city. Uh, and probably the closest one is on the Homewood campus. That's about six stories below me right now. I'm in the Eisenhower Library. Um, we have what's called the cage, and it is at the lowest level of the library. Here's a photo of half of the cage. Uh, and we call it that because it's where some of the rarest and the most valuable university objects are stored. So for example, we have, I was looking through the other day, I found a box of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs uh, from the first century BCE. Uh, so it's just, it's very exciting because this is one of the rooms I get to work in. Here's a photo of the other half of the cage where you can see my little workstation here. Uh, I really love working in this room because you're, you're literally surrounded by history. Uh, and I could probably spend days just exploring the shelves. Uh, what you can't see is that there are about 10 shelves to the right of this picture. And then there are about 10 shelves that go back in the middle. So there are thousands of objects down here. Uh, the reason that this room is not pleasant to work in though is because it is uh, designed for the comfort of the books and not for me. So it is kept as cold as possible at around 59 degrees uh, and it's climate controlled as well uh, to protect everything that is in there. So usually you'll see me walking into the library, even in the middle of the summer with a full winter coat. Now we also have an offsite facility that's called the Library Service Center. Here's a photo of that, that has most of our special collection. There are tens of thousands of boxes of objects here. And we have two people in special collections who most of their job is just to, to oversee all of this. So I have uh, my colleague, Amy, who I call the, the where person. So she keeps track of where all of these objects are, who's using them, where do they need to be. And my colleague Jim, I call the, uh, the what person. He provides information to the public on what we have uh, because we get dozens and dozens of research requests, probably hundreds every year, from different researchers that are trying to use our collections for different things. Now, uh, not all of our special collections are actually hidden from public view. We keep about 300,000 of them hidden actually in plain sight in one of the most visited places in Baltimore City, and that is, of course, the George Peabody Library. Uh, every book that you see in this photo is technically part of special collections. Uh, these are cataloged, and people can and do research these books in the library. Now, the Peabody also has a rare books room. Uh, it's up on the fourth floor. You, you can't see it from ground level, but if you can see my cursor, it's somewhere, somewhere back here. Uh, this rare books room also has a bunch of treasures, kind of a cage within itself. And it's also kept in a fully sealed and climate controlled room. Now, what's interesting about this room as well is that unlike the rest of the Peabody Library, which has a, a water sprinkler system in case of a fire, this room has a halon gas system in case of a fire that will put out the flames without damaging anything inside. Now, we also keep objects at the Evergreen Museum and Library. This is also in North Baltimore. I highly recommend visiting if you have the chance the entire house is really fun to tour. 
Uh, this is where we keep the university's copy of Shakespeare's first folio. Here's a photo of that here. Uh, this is the first ever collection of Shakespeare's plays. It was compiled actually after his death, but it, it's really one of the rarest books in the world uh, and arguably one of the most important books to Western literature. And I've heard a rumor about this book that I cannot confirm, but that it's the only book that the university does not allow to travel. So if you want to look at this book, you cannot see it here at Sheridan Libraries. They will not put it on a truck and bring it here. You have to go see it there. Now we also have a conservation lab on site that will fix damaged items. They will stabilize things for you know, public exhibitions because we do a lot of public exhibits here. Uh, and these people are actually trained chemists and scientists. So if any of you are interested in both chemistry and history, this could be a really interesting job for you. So uh, my, my job title is I'm a, I'm a curator, uh, and that can probably, I think, be best summed up as uh, interpretation. My job is to interpret my collections and to make those interpretations and the collections in general more accessible to the public. So whether that's through uh, teaching, whether that's through online exhibits or in-person exhibits, or you even have a Facebook page for the collection. And my work is mostly self-directed. Uh, I have a lot of freedom, so I generally get to choose the research that I want to do. So my interests are in finding ways to make these songs in the collection relevant to people in the 21st century. Now, as I said earlier, the main collection I work with is the Levy Sheet Music Collection, the one with about 30,000 songs. Uh, and in interpreting the sheet music, I think it's really important to point out that the songs in this collection are a very unique kind of primary source. Uh, now, as I'm sure all of us know, a primary source is an original source of information, probably created during the time period that it represents. So an example might be uh, the original text of a law or maybe even an artifact from ancient Egypt. Whereas a secondary source will add a layer of interpretation. It might uh, quote or otherwise use a primary source. So that might be a book about law or a book about ancient Egypt. So let's take an example of a song from the Levy collection. This is called Ruined Through the Strike. And this is the cover of the sheet music here. So if you opened up this cover, you would see the music behind it. This is from 1894, and it tells a completely fictional made up story about a protest. Uh, it's very closely modeled after a real protest, which was the Pullman strike in Chicago in 1894. But this particular song is not a firsthand description. So uh, using the chat, do you think that this is a primary source or a secondary source? I'll give everyone a few seconds to think and type that into the chat, but I will give you a hint. It's not as easy as an answer as you might think. All right, we have some people saying primary, some people saying secondary, some more primary, some more secondary. I'll give you all a few more seconds here. All right, well, the good news is that everyone was correct. Uh, this is both a primary and a secondary source uh, because it depends on what you're researching. So if you were researching, for example, the actual real Pullman strike of 1894, I would argue this is a secondary source because it adds a layer of interpretation. It's talking about a different protest. You might be better off finding a, maybe a firsthand account of what happened. However, if you're studying how the public reacts to protest, I would argue that this is a primary source because that's what music is. It's how people react to the world around them. And that's something that historic music tells us that absolutely nothing else can. You know, we can read about history and we can learn about what happened, but when we can actually see the music that people used or even sing it ourselves, it transports us back to that time and place. Uh, and it's a completely different way of experiencing history. And that's why I love studying it. Uh, it's sort of like, you, you know, you can read about the Battle of Thermopylae in ancient Greece between the Spartans and the Persians, and you can see the movie 300, which was, which was written about that. But if you actually visit Greece, which I admittedly have not done, but if you go visit Greece, you can actually stand on the battlefield where the Battle of Thermopylae took place. You can see where it happened. You can see the terrain around you. Uh, and it's just a completely different way of experiencing history. Uh, now, this distinction between primary and secondary sources, it might seem unimportant, but it's actually really critical to how we evaluate these sources, understanding its role as a primary or a secondary source. Uh, and this evaluation is part of a series of questions that I ask myself 
uh, not only when I look at a historic document, but really at any information that I encounter in my day to day. Uh, you know, we live in an age, of course, where we are constantly being bombarded with information, whether it be uh, social media, the news, or even, you know, public advertisements. And, and I think whether we realize it or not, we are constantly doing sort of like a micro evaluations on primary sources. And by primary sources, I'm including every, you know, tweet and Instagram post that comes up on our feed. You know, we're, we're really evaluating things as we scroll. So something that I do as a curator is to bring those evaluations to the front of my mind to determine if I'm going to trust this information, because that's what evaluation is about. It's do I trust the information that's in front of me? Uh, and I do it with my own specific set of questions. Uh, and the questions I ask myself are first, uh, who is telling this story? Who is the source? Uh, second, who benefits from the story? Who stands to gain uh, or even profit? Third is related to the second is who does not benefit? Is anybody left out of this story? Uh, and lastly, which is slightly less important is, is how did this get my attention? So to give you an example of the process of asking these questions, uh, let's take another song from the collection. I'll pull it up here. This is called, uh, Oh, Let My People Go. Uh, this song appears to be a primary source uh, on slavery, but investigations into it actually show that it's a primary, or, I'm sorry, a secondary source. So uh, this was published in 1861. That's the year the Civil War began. Uh, and this is probably the most widely recognized song that we know was sung by enslaved communities. Uh, we know that religion was practiced to varying degrees by slaves, of course, depending on what they were permitted to do. Uh, you know, there are reports of slaves joining their master's family for prayer, but we also know that they would often hold secret religious meetings that could last throughout the night. So this song is a reference to the liberation of the ancient Jewish people from slavery. Uh, the text comes from Exodus, in which God speaks to Moses, telling him to go to Pharaoh and demand that he let my people go. I'm sure you've heard that phrase before. Uh, what's interesting about the song too is it's reported to have been used by Harriet Tubman uh, as a code song that fugitive slaves would use to communicate when fleeing Maryland. It would be sort of a secret code. All right, so question number one, who is telling the story? Uh, now, if you look at the cover, you can see it says arranged by Thomas Baker. So that means he took the words and he took the melody and he created the version that you see here. Uh, now, one note about Thomas Baker is that he was, uh, he was not a slave, he was a white musician, and he's actually from England. And we actually have a note on the first page of music, and you can see that this was first heard sung by escaped slaves when they arrived at Fortress Monroe. So basically, uh, Thomas Baker presumably heard these people singing, and he wrote down his interpretation of what he heard. Now, the vast majority of music that was sung by slaves was arranged afterwards by people outside of that community, by, by white people. Uh, the most well-known of these is a compilation called Slave Songs of the United States, which was published in 1867, uh, so about six years after this song. Uh, and that goes into a lot of really great detail about the difficulty that white arrangers had in transcribing some of these songs uh, or setting these songs to paper, writing them down, because they just did not conform to typical music notation. They didn't fit neatly into the bars. And it's something that is, it's, I think, unfortunate that a lot of this music that was sung by enslaved communities, because it was notated or arranged by people outside that community, it's lost a lot of its original performance tradition. You know, the music was molded and sort of uh, sometimes oversimplified so that it could fit into these bars so that it could be published. Uh, and this changes how I interpret this song. You know, the, the slaves that originally sang the song did not have the means or maybe even the desire to publish the song themselves, but it still means that the song uh, does not give us the full picture of how slaves use music because this layer of interpretation was added. So that's question one, that's who's the source. Uh, and I asked this question almost subconsciously, even on my own Twitter or my, my Instagram feed. You know, if it's a news story that pops up on my feed, the first thing I check is the source. Uh, and I'll take something much more seriously if it's from a source that I recognize or have experienced, grown to trust, versus a source that I've never heard of before, uh, even if this information is being shared with me by a trusted friend. Now, uh, let's go to question number two. Who benefits from this story? So in the case of this song, it was the publisher. You can see the publisher is usually listed at the bottom of the sheet music. 
So here it is Horace and Waters in New York, and you can see much smaller below that in Boston, it was by Oliver Ditson and Co. So those are the publishers. They're the ones who actually printed this music on paper and sold it. So they gained the most. They financially profited off of this song. And it's also likely that Thomas Baker had a contract with them so that he would receive a certain portion of the proceeds. Now, this was uh, published in New York and Boston, cities in the north. Uh, so it may have even played a part in educating northerners about how slaves were using music. So therefore, I think someone could argue that this maybe had a public benefit. But then question three, who does not benefit? Well, it's the original singers, it's the slaves. Uh, you know, this was published by a person writing about a community that he's not in. And so uh, those slaves likely did not share in the profits of this song. Now, the last question is how, how does this get our attention? Um, so sheet music would be sold in stores alongside a lot of other sheet music. Uh, so publishers would have to use different ways to try to catch people's eye. So uh, using the chat, what catches your eye on the first page? Go ahead and type it in. Uh, if you were, you know, walking by this, let's say it's in a music store window, is there a particular word or uh, image that you would see first? And there's really not a wrong answer here. I'll give you a few seconds. All right, the fancy fonts. People, a lot of people are saying contrabands, the four corners, the fancy borders. Yep. Yeah. The words, font size and color. Yep, a lot of choice went into the fonts here. Um, the, the first word that captured my attention is the word contrabands. Now, a contraband, this is a reference to a policy of the Union, the North, during the Civil War. Uh, because at the outbreak of the Civil War, a lot of fugitive slaves that escaped north were actually sent back down to the south. But the policy shifted pretty soon into the war to declare that these fugitive slaves who had escaped from the south would be called contrabands of war, which basically meant captured enemy property. Uh, and many of these fugitive slaves were employed as laborers by the Union Army, uh, and some of them were even paid a wage. So when we see the word contraband in music from this period, it's usually referring to an escaped slave that's being held by the union. So I find it pretty interesting that the word contrabands is by far the largest word on this page. Uh, and this indicates to me that this was a marketing decision. You know, they wanted the audience to know that this was a song from the enslaved community. Uh, like I said, this was published in New York and Boston. So it's possible that it was maybe marketed towards Northerners who maybe could feel like they're getting a window into African-American culture. Uh, although, as I mentioned earlier, there's of course this layer of interpretation added and in being arranged by Thomas Baker. Uh, but I think it's also possible that this piece was marketed towards the free black community in the North. But regardless, the publisher saw this piece as special because it was a song of the contrabands. I think they knew that having that word so large would maybe catch somebody's eye and make it stand out from countless other songs. Uh, and as we all know, that mechanism of advertising really hasn't changed. Advertising really is its virtual visual uh, competition. Times Square, for example, there's so much advertising going on here. Everyone is trying to catch your eye. And I think that advertising and information in general uh, has countless ways of getting our attention. And I think it's worth noting, at least to ourselves, what method they're using uh, in advertising. So, Maybe are you watching uh, on TV and suddenly an advertisement will come on and it's twice as loud as what you were watching before? Or did you do a Google search for a soccer video game and suddenly see an advertisement for one pop up on social media? Uh, these are just little notes that I make to myself about uh, how I am being advertised to. Now, uh, there's one important question that I left out here. And that question specifically relates to special collections uh, or historic items. And it has to do with a term called uh, provenance. Now, provenance refers to the ownership of an item and the chronology of its ownership. So the question here is basically, uh, where did this object come from? Who owned it before we did? And sometimes this is an important question for ethical reasons. For example, uh, the university will not knowingly acquire something that was stolen. Uh, and when we accept donations or when we purchase historical objects, we will often require the donor to provide proof or documentation of the item's provenance uh, because something that's very unfortunately common in conflict, uh, you know, war, for example, 
is for a, a victorious or maybe an occupying power to seize cultural objects and artifacts and either sell them or even destroy them sometimes. And the university wants to ensure that it doesn't inadvertently participate in the trade or the sale of those items. Now, another reason we ask this question of provenance is because sometimes an object can have a much higher value just because it was owned or used by a famous person. You know, think maybe a guitar signed by a rock star. So I'll show you uh, two songs from the Levy collection that have a significant provenance just because of who owned them. So here's a song about Amelia Earhart. This is called Lady Lindy, We're All For You. Now, I actually put this song on display back in February as part of a small exhibition because I just thought it was awesome. It's, you know, it's about Amelia Earhart. You can see we have this really neat image of her on the cover. Uh, and then fast forward to August, I was going through about 15 boxes of Mr. Levy's correspondence, uh, business dealings to learn more about how he amassed his collection. Uh, thousands of documents. Uh, and I happened to find this letter that Mr. Levy wrote. Uh, and you can see, I underlined in red, he notes that the copy of Lady Lindy has Amelia Earhart's autograph on the cover. So I immediately went and looked at the music again. Uh, and sure enough, on the cover, there is her autograph right there, uh, which really just, it, it blew my mind. You know, I, I had been holding this object in my hands and it had once been in her hands. Uh, and that's what I love about working in special collections and archives in particular is you honestly never know what you'll find when you're going through an archive. Uh, now, another song in the collection uh, is this one. I'm sure most of you will recognize it. Uh, it's probably the most valuable song in the entire collection. Um, it probably is one of the more valuable objects that uh, we own in special collections. Uh, and that is a first ever edition of the Star Spangled Banner. Now, uh, we all know Francis Scott Key wrote the words, the poem for the Star Spangled Banner. It was originally called the Battle of Fort McHenry. Um, and the, the words actually appeared in a newspaper, uh, but this is the first ever time that the, um, the words and the melody were printed in the same place. The melody had existed before. It was already written uh, in England. It was called Anacreon in Heaven, but this is the first ever time that Thomas Carr put the words to the melody and printed it. And he did it very, very quickly because he knew that this song was going to be a hit and we, he wanted to be the first person to publish it. So in his haste, he actually forgot, you'll see, forgot to add the letter T to the word patriotic. So uh, this is a way that we identify first editions of the Star Spangled Banner is it's called a periodic song rather than a patriotic song. So there are only about 10 to 12 of these first editions left in existence. Uh, we don't know exactly for sure. Um, I know that the Maryland Historical Society in Baltimore has a copy. Uh, I believe it's on display actually, if you'd like to see it. Uh, and the White House of course has a copy as well. Um, now, Mr. Levy who collected all of these songs, he really, really wanted a copy of the Star Spangled Banner. This was the, you know, the prize item for sheet music collectors in the 20th century. Uh, all of his friends knew that he wanted a copy and were keeping, keeping an ear to the ground for him. So, one of his friends, Elliot Shapiro, got a call saying, uh, I have a copy of the Star Spangled Banner, I'd like to sell it. So this friend called Levy and said, uh, you know, he put the two of them in touch. He said, you have to go to this hotel uh, and meet this seller who is selling the Star Spangled Banner. So Levy drives to the hotel, I believe it's in Hagerstown, Maryland, uh, and he meets the seller and he sees this Star Spangled Banner uh, and he buys it immediately. But he notices on the side, if you can see my cursor, Right over here, there are a couple of very, very small tears in it. And there's even a, a little bit larger of a tear in the middle here. Uh, he thought this was a bit strange, but this is the first copy of the Star Spangled Banner. Of course he's gonna buy it. So as he's driving home, he decides to stop in a antique store uh, and he asks if they have any sheet music. And the owner of the antique store says, yes, we actually have um, a little box of sheet music in the back. Uh, and in a little book, you'll find an early edition of the Star Spangled Banner. And the store owner says, actually, someone was looking through it um, this morning, but they didn't end up buying anything. So Mr. Levy goes and he starts looking through, thinking he's going to find another Star Spangled Banner, and it's missing. But he notices that there are a couple of pieces of paper left where something has been ripped out. So he goes back to his car, he grabs the Star Spangled Banner, and he finds that the, the tears exactly match. Uh, and so he gives it back to the store owner. 
uh, you know, it, it had been stolen that very morning. Uh, and what he originally or eventually did was he, he bought it a second time from the dealer, although for much, much, much more money because the dealer realized uh, how valuable this was. So uh, Levy did the right thing. He, you know, he returned it, he bought it again, and he held on to it for a long time. Uh, and then many, many years later, one of these sold at auction, uh, and I think it went for about $500,000. So when he heard that news, Mr. Levy immediately drove it down to Johns Hopkins University uh, and he asked us to put it in a safe for him. And eventually he donated it and his entire collection to us. So, uh, you know, a historical piece can have a crazy history of its own as well. So if any of you are interested in looking at items in our special collections, uh, you know, please come visit us, of course, once we resume in-person services. Uh, you can find all of our collections through the library's catalog, which is catalyst.library.jhu.edu. So if there are any uh, subjects you're interested in, any specific documents or papers, you can search for them here. Uh, and if it comes up, contact Special Collections for Use. Um, that will come to us and we can help you find it. Often we have a lot of things digitized, so we may be able to provide you with a digital copy, um, or we could you know, possibly arrange for an in-person visit. So. Those are our special collections, just a little bit of how I approach them and interpret them. Um, I'll go ahead and yield my time back to Simeon to see if any questions have come up. Sam, thank you. Uh, we, we, do have, we do have some and they're, they're kind of jumping, jumping from topic to topic a little bit as you might, as you might imagine. Uh, going back to the, the books in the beginning with the paintings on the sides, Yes. Uh, there was there was a person who was curious about the title of the the book that had Shakespeare and the cottage painted on the side. Do you happen to know that by chance? I don't know off the top of my head, but if there's a way that we can uh, follow up by email, I'm happy to to research that and send it to everybody. Okay. Uh, second question. Uh, th there's a person who who has received a, an 1870s Bible with a broken spine, and is just curious. How does one go about finding a, a place to get these sorts of things fixed. Is that mm. turning to the library for reference or what, what would you say? Question. Um, you know, what I'd probably do is put them in touch with our conservation department. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's not something that our department uh, can take on, I'm sure that they have uh, local contacts uh, who they could put uh, you in touch with so that you can get that repaired. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think you've addressed this one, but I'm going to ask it just in case. Uh, so if someone wanted to access notes from, from someone that might be in the library, so Hopkins, uh, Stanley Hall established the first psychology lab at JHU in 1883. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so in terms of, of figuring out if his papers went to Hopkins, that would be looking through Catalyst, it would be a good first step. Yep, you can, you can look through Catalyst, or if you'd like, you can also email us at um, specialcollections at jhu.edu. Uh, that's our main special collections email. Um, and the person that I mentioned earlier, uh, Jim, who is the what person, uh, mm -hmm. he's been here for, I think, 30 or 40 years, and he has uh, an amazing institutional knowledge of what we have. So uh, he might know off the top of his head if we have it and what's in there. Um, but he also has back-end access to our archives and can find a lot more information. So I'd recommend, um, if you're not finding something on Catalyst, just to email us directly at Special Collections. Mm -hmm. So what, what happens if JHU purchases something that, that turns out to be stolen or, or mm -hmm. fake? That's a really good question. Um, so it's, there's, I, I don't know if we have you know, a, a specific process um, what I think is most likely to happen is that we would contact uh, or track down the original owner uh, and we would likely give it back to them. Um, but I don't know, you know, I think it would have to be individually investigated, um, but I do know that it would be investigated. Now, as far as items that are fake, we actually have an entire collection of uh, literary forgeries, um, books that are claiming to be something but are not, or, you know, long lost maybe Shakespeare operas or, or, or not operas, but Shakespeare plays uh, that are not actually written by Shakespeare. So um, it could possibly be added to that collection or um, I have a feeling that there may be some you know, legal recourse if this was a, a very expensive purchase 
uh, and we, we receive it and it is not what we think it is, um, I do see the university, you know, following up on that. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. There's a question about access to the collection. So who, who can gain access to the collection? Do you have to have an affiliation to Hopkins? Um, how, does, how does that work? Sure, so uh, typically, you know, pre and post COVID, you do not have to be affiliated. Anybody can come in uh, and make an appointment with us at different locations to view our collection. So uh, the room that I'm in right now at uh, Hopkins Libraries on Homewood campus is our main special collection space. Um, so we could meet with you here and show you things. Uh, you can also see objects at the George Peabody Library and the Evergreen Museum. Mm -hmm. uh, currently due to COVID, I believe we're only allowing Hopkins affiliated researchers uh, in. Um, but I think if you were interested in coming in and don't have a Hopkins affiliation, I would say just email us at Special Collections and you know, we'll see if there's a way that we could, uh, we could do that. But right now we're open uh, three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday from nine to two o'clock. Um, for appointment uh, only special collections research. And we've actually had quite a few uh, Hopkins researchers coming in during COVID. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, is the sheet music ever played? Are there recordings of these songs in the collection or where, where could these be found? Uh, yes, uh, there are actually about 800 uh, songs in the collection have historical audio. Um, so, uh, and maybe afterwards we can send an email out with a link to the Levy website, um, or you can also, of course, Google the Lester Levy sheet music collection. Um, and there is a place on the website where you can uh, select songs with historical audio. Um, now, everything on the Levy website, all 30,000 songs uh, are visible, unless, of course, it's under copyright. So, songs that are under copyright are after, published after 1925. So, Anything published before 1925, you can see it on the website, you can download it, you're free to perform it. Uh, if it's published after 1925, you can email us at Special Collections and we'll provide you with a personal copy for your own research. That way we're not uh, you know, violating copyright law by having something publicly. Um, but we actually encourage recordings and uh, if you are a musician and would like to record something from the collection, we would love to put it on our website as well. Awesome. Sam, could you talk a little bit? I, I know that part of, of what your role is, is is both cataloging and understanding what's in the collection, but then also connecting the, the collection back out to the public in, in different ways. Mm -hmm. And this talk is obviously one of those ways, but what are some of the other things that you've done and, and how have you involved students, both undergraduate and if, if others, in, in that process? Sure. Um, so I think the, to the first part of the question, um, a, a really great way that we can make these collections uh, publicly accessible is through exhibitions. Uh, we do a lot of public exhibits and a lot of these exhibits are involving Johns Hopkins uh, and Baltimore students. Uh, so we have a couple of exhibit spaces. We have uh, the George Peabody Library is probably the biggest one. If you've been to the Peabody Library, uh, there's sort of an ante room called the exhibit gallery that and can fit about 200 people and it's, it's a really huge exhibit space. Uh, we have one at the Eisenhower Library. Uh, the Homewood Museum can also do exhibits and Evergreen can also do exhibits. Um, so we have a lot of librarians and Hopkins professors that will work with students to do exhibits. Uh, in addition to that, um, I also currently have a group of students that are going through the Levy Collection uh, and they're identifying all of the songs that were composed by women and songs composed by African Americans. Uh, and that way on the Levy website, when someone is looking for music, they can filter by those terms. Uh, we also have done a couple of uh, live performances. Uh, so back in February, uh, we did a, a program at the Peabody Library called In the Stacks. Uh, and we did a, uh, I think it was an hour long sort of immersive theater performance. Uh, and by immersive, I mean that uh, you would walk around the Peabody Library and have uh, actors interacting with you. And all of these actors and actresses uh, were inspired by people from Johns Hopkins collections. Uh, and a lot of them were inspired by sheet music. So for example, we had uh, this aviator who is a character that was inspired by uh, Amelia Earhart. And then we had a small display of sheet music where we had Amelia Earhart, uh, that, that sheet music I showed you visible. So uh, there's lots of ways to get involved. Uh, and I'd encourage anybody if you're interested in working with us uh, on an online exhibit or interested in doing research to get in touch and, and we can find a way to work together. 
So I think this is going to be a, a question that can go in a lot of different directions. Um, sure. What do you have to study to become a curator? And so maybe talk a little bit more about your what what you did, but then some of your colleagues, because it sounds like they come from a wide variety of backgrounds. Yes, um, there are there are I mean infinite types of curators, and it all depends on the institution you're working at. But most curators have a specific area of research or study. So, um, so my background is as a performer. I played the French horn for about 15 years. Uh, I got my master's degree in performance at Peabody. Um, and I also had a lot of experience um, with programs like In the Stacks, with doing public programs that work with special collections. Um, but I'm really, I'm, I think I'm the only person on the special collections uh, staff that specializes in sheet music. So I was kind of surprised at, at how much I took for granted with sheet music and you know, opening up a piece of music and showing my colleagues like, oh yeah, it starts in C minor and it progresses to F major and here are the performer's notes. Um, things that I thought were obvious, but my colleagues had no idea what they were looking at. So um, that's kind of my area of expertise. Um, I have a degree in, um, two, two degrees in French horn performance. Uh, now, a lot of my colleagues have um, a master's in library science and MLS, um, or they might have a degree in museum studies. Uh, two of our other curators both have, I think, their doctorate in uh, literature. So they work with our rare books and manuscripts. Um, but, you know, for example, the, the Smithsonian's or the Walters Museums in, in Baltimore and D.C., when they have curatorial positions open up, they're very specific in the description of what experience they're looking for. So I think a recent position opened up at the Walters Museum that said, uh, we're looking for a curator of Asian art. So they were looking for somebody who um, maybe not necessarily had a degree, but could prove that they had done enough research or had enough understanding of Asian art uh, that, that they could you know, effectively interpret the collection. So um, I hope that's an okay answer, Simeon. Uh, you can really have, as long as you have you know, a solid background in an area of expertise, uh, I think that your chances uh, are, of being a curator are good. And I think I'm, I'm living proof of that as well. Are there songs in the collection to which you have a, a particularly strong emotional connection? Hmm. That is a good question. I have to think about that one. Um, I think, I think the songs that I have the, the biggest emotional connection to are the ones that I have, uh, I have worked with for, and we, we did a recent online exhibit on, um, on suffrage. We have a lot of songs related to the suffrage movement um, about the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. Uh, and we have a particular song called uh, Suffrage March. Uh, and it's, it's got on the inside cover, it's got this really amazing speech that the composer wrote advocating women's rights and, and the women's right to vote in particular. Um, and it's a self-published song. This, this uh, woman composed the song and she printed and published it herself. So to hold something like that in your hands and to know that, uh, that this woman, Lucinia Richards is her name, to know that she put her heart and soul into the song and she published it herself um, because she needed to get her message out. Uh, I think those are the kinds of songs that resonate with me where you can see the, uh, the emotional effort that went into creating it. So, so as you as you think about the, the Johns Hopkins collection writ large and the various locations, what yep. percentage of that is actually cataloged? Do you have do you have any idea? Mm -hmm. I, I imagine you're constantly acquiring and bringing in people like you to. Right, right. I would say. Uh, you know, this is a, an educated guess, but I'd, I'd guess around 80 to 85 percent is cataloged. Mm -hmm. um, we do have, a, you know, of course, a backlog because we take in items more quickly than we can uh, process and catalog them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, one job I'm doing right now in, in working in the cage is going through our sheet music backlog because back in the early 2000s, uh, a lot of sheet music was donated to the university, um, but there was nobody on staff who knew what they were looking at. They couldn't look at something and say, yes, this is, you know, this is a first edition of something published in the 18th century. This is extremely important. Um, so we have, uh, I think, 60 boxes of sheet music down there right now that I'm going through three days a week. Um, and I, you know, kind of finding these little treasures. Um, so we also have a little bit of a backlog at LSE as well. 
Uh, but we have someone on staff whose sole job is to process things. Her name's Kristen. Uh, she's a processing archivist, uh, and her job is to take these collections and to make sense of them. So uh, if I go back to my photo of the cage, where is that? So this is where Kristen works, and this entire table behind her uh, it looks very unorganized, but there is a method to her madness. Um, she is going through this collection, and she's putting things into piles to try to make them more user-friendly, because uh, what's likely is that whoever owned this collection just gave it all to us and didn't organize it whatsoever. So it's her job to, to go through everything and to, to make sense of it. And then uh, we have a, a team on site called the technical services team, and they do entry of what's called the metadata. Uh, the metadata is all of the, the, the pieces of information about, uh, about an object. So with sheet music, for example, when we're entering metadata, we are looking at the music and we're typing in the title of the song, we're typing in the composer, we're typing in the year it was published, uh, we're typing in if there's any advertisements on the back. Uh, so it's a, a lot of effort to, to, to get all this information uh, into the system so that the collections are usable. And that's something I'm working on as well, is, um, is making our sheet music collections more accessible uh, by typing in all of this very tedious, uh, tedious metadata. So who, who decides what collections and pieces JHU acquires or, or even accepts and like, what's that process like? Sure. So the main person who makes those decisions is the head of our archives. His name is Jordan Steele. Uh, he is the one who oversees all of the university's archives. Um, so if, uh, if something, is, you know, someone wants to donate something, uh, he will often be the person to approve it. Uh, and he'll often consult with the curators as well. Um, so, for example, we had, uh, there was an item that went up for auction that was related to sheet music, um, and he reached out to me to say, you know, what do you think about us acquiring this? Is this something that we need to have in our collections? But uh, ultimately, a lot of that will, uh, will go to him. Uh, and then another person who, who weighs in on that is, uh, is my boss, who is our director of special collections. Her name's Margaret. Uh, so between the two of them, they have uh, a lot of that, that control over what we purchase and, and what we'll accept. Uh, what is the difference between personal archives that are donated to JHU and mm -hmm. the special collections? Uh, sure. So uh, a personal archive is a type of special collections, um, but not every special collection is an archive. So um, special collections might be, uh, you know, the, the Shakespeare folios that I mentioned. Those are all uh, types of or part of our special collections, but they are not an archive. Uh, a personal archives is, is just somebody's personal paper. So a lot of the donations we get are maybe a, you know, a tenured Johns Hopkins professor, maybe who's been working at the university for their entire career. They have all of these books and documents related to their work um, and that, that there we think will be interesting. So those are the types of kind of personal collections uh, that get donated. We also have people that will donate sheet music to us, for example. Uh, we'll get a note saying, you know, maybe um, my parents just died and I looked through their piano bench and I found all of the sheet music, so I want to donate it to you. Uh, and that's the type of thing where that would get kicked down to me since that's my specialty. And I would look at it and say, well, um, you know, this is a great personal connection, but most of your music is from 1950 and we have a ton of music from 1950. Most of these items are duplicates of what we already have. So in this particular case, it's not really worth the effort for us to process this. Since we already have, uh, since we already have it processed, if that makes sense. Okay. Yep. It does. Yeah. Uh, what's the oldest? Uh, what's the oldest piece of music in in the Levy collection? How far back does it go? I think the oldest piece is from. I think it's from the 1790s. Um, I think one of the the oldest pieces that we have is from uh, George Washington's funeral. Uh, it's the only copy of the song that was played at George Washington's funeral. So um, we don't have very many songs from the 1700s. Most of them are from the 18 and, and 1900s, but uh, we do have about, I think, 16 songs from the 1700s. Uh, and the thing is that, that before that, we don't really have uh, a lot of surviving sheet music from before that, from colonial America. Uh, a lot of the songs that were sung before that were not uh, printed. A lot of it was an oral tradition. Uh, or maybe they would just print the words to something and say, 
you know, sing these songs to the tune of this other song. And so you would know that tune and you would sing the words along to it. So uh, pre-1700s, a lot of the records that we have of uh, American sheet music come actually from, from newspapers. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, does the library have any illuminated manuscripts? I believe that we do, um, but I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I think if we do, they're probably stored at the, uh, the Peabody Library. Um, I do know that we have different, um, different books that are, you know, uh, you know, they have like gold trim or they have paintings on them or they're maybe made from, uh, from animal skins and things like that. So in that sense, uh, I, do, I do feel pretty confident saying that, that we have them, but I don't know off the top of my head which ones those are. Sam, could you, do you know the story of the Peabody Library, how it came to be part of Hopkins or so that's kind of a, that's kind of, a, I mean, how it came to be and then how it, how it became part of Hopkins. I think that's a, a fascinating story for people to hear. Yeah, I, I know a little bit of about it and, may, and maybe if anyone else knows, they can fill in the blanks as well. But uh, the original uh, design for the Peabody Library was actually, um, it was put to a contest. There was a competition to see uh, you know, what the Peabody Library should look like. And there was only one, uh, one particular note that the designers had and that they did not want Gothic architecture. Uh, and Gothic architecture is like, if you look at churches that have these really tall dramatic spires and things like that, uh, very ornate, that's Gothic architecture. Um, and they did not want Gothic architecture because it was too associated with religion, actually. They wanted uh, neoclassical or neo-Greek architecture um, because you know, the Greeks and, uh, you know, the, the ancient Greeks were supposedly these, uh, you know, the, philo the philosophical philosophers, these, uh, these enlightened individuals, they, they kind of wanted to follow that path of architecture rather than religious architecture. Um, so it's, the, the library is actually, it's, it's one of the first libraries built uh, that has, it's entirely uh, non-made of wood. Uh, they really did not want to have any wood in the library because of uh, the fear of fires, because it was originally uh, lit by gas and oil lamps. So for example, the floor of the library is made of marble. Um, all of the, the, the columns are cast iron. Uh, all of the, the railings are cast iron as well. And the original bookshelves were actually iron. Um, but now in modern times, we've replaced some of those with wood because we have an adequate fire prevention system. So uh, the Peabody Library existed on its own from 1860s to around the 1960s. Uh, and that's when the Peabody Institute was kind of uh, folded under Johns Hopkins uh, wing and has been ever since. Uh, I don't know exactly how the Peabody Institute came to be under Hopkins. Uh, that might be something I'd have to look into a little bit more. Yes, yeah, so I think the I think the story, the original story of the library, uh, George Peabody was a dry goods salesperson who had never was was uneducated. Actually, had not gone through through much schooling and mm -hmm. wanted to create an opportunity for a, for an open space, a public library. And so the original design of the library was to create opportunities for people to see books in ways that he hadn't and sent people, speaking of special collections, to scour the world for representative pieces of the great works that were you know, at, available at that time. Uh, and then there is a whole story that goes, uh, goes for how Hopkins acquired that eventually. But I think it's a great... Uh, we have people who are on the call from all over the world. If you're ever in Baltimore, it's one of the must must see places in in Baltimore. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's been rated one of the most beautiful libraries in the world, uh, and it, it's a place I've been in hundreds of times. Uh, and it really it it never it never gets old. Let me see where my picture of the Peabody Library is. There it is. Uh, Sam, are there any songs in the collection that you would consider controversial, and if so, why? Yeah, absolutely. So, so like I said, the collection follows all of U.S. history. Uh, and as we know, U.S. history has a lot of really dark and controversial and terrible times. Um, so we have a lot of music uh, that is particularly denigrating to, to the other. So we have a lot of music that's very uh, denigrating and critical to African Americans, uh, to immigrants, to Jewish people to the Irish. Uh, and it's something that's, that's a really, uh, it's challenging in working with this collection is, is finding ways to, to contextualize those songs 
uh, and to make them available so that people can study this history, you know, um, because that's why these songs were, were collected is, uh, even though Mr. Levy did not agree with these songs, he collected them because he felt like they needed to be preserved so that we can study this history. And I think that this is an appropriate place for this kind of difficult history is, you know, not maybe not in a public exhibition or uh, in a performance hall. I don't think that these uh, these controversial songs should necessarily be performed or put on display. Uh, but I do think that there needs to be a place for them to uh, be contextualized and studied uh, so that we can prevent this kind of sentiment from happening again. Uh, so we do have a couple of places on the Levy website uh, where we provide information about, uh, you know, you're encountering songs that are from U.S. history. So uh, they will be controversial, they will be hurtful. Um, this is why they're here, and this is why you should not perform these in public uh, or display them in public. Is there an age limit for access to those special collections? Um, not that I know of. I think if you were to, to contact us and, and, and let us know that you were, you know, you had a research interest in a particular collection, uh, I, I can't think of an instance in which uh, somebody was, you know, denied because of age. Um, I think, if anything, you might just have to be accompanied by, uh, you know, maybe a guardian over the age of 18. Do you happen to know the oldest resource in the whole JHU collection? Ooh. I, I don't know the, the particular one, but I do know, you know, I've, I've seen we have uh, some, uh, some, I think, papyrus from first century BCE Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think we have some scrolls that are in cuneiform as well. Uh, so I can confidently say we have, we have things that were produced, uh, B, you know, in the BC, BC times, uh, but I don't know exactly which the oldest one is. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. So how do you decide what kinds of activities that, that you're going to do? So as you're making choices of the special events, like what, what are the criteria that, that you're using mm -hmm. uh, or the library is using more, more broadly? What's that thought process like? Sure, that's a good question. So uh, a lot of it has to do with kind of my own personal interests. Uh, you know, I've always found in programming that uh, if you're gonna present something to somebody, it has to be what you're passionate about because uh, audiences of any kind, whether it's looking at a performance uh, or looking at an exhibit, I think people can tell if you're presenting something you're not passionate about. Um, so I am, you know, I'm particularly passionate about, uh, you know, maybe U.S. reform movements like suffrage, uh, emancipation, things like that. So a lot of the research I've done has been into those movements um, for no other reason than I'm passionate about it. I'm motivated to study it. Uh, or, you know, sometimes we'll have uh, a particular time period, you know, so for, for example, right now is, is the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment from 1920, giving women the right to vote. So the university is doing a lot of work around suffrage. So that created kind of a really easy opportunity to work with the suffrage songs in the collection. So uh, I would say it's 50-50. It's sometimes that, uh, that creative motivation comes from within, and sometimes it's kind of an external factor that is saying, you know, this is what the university or this is what the world is focusing on right now. This is the, the content that we have uh, a need or a void for. Okay. Well, Sam, our, our, hour, our hour is upon us. I, I wanna thank you. I also wanna put in a couple of plugs that uh, you know, certainly if people are interested in the collection or the library, library more broadly, a quick search will take you right there and uh, there, there are way more resources than Sam has, has described. Also, Hopkins at Home, which is, uh, Sam, you put together some materials for Hopkins at Home. So if you go to the JHU website, search Hopkins at Home and Leave It Collection, you'll see uh, more if you want to know more about this particular, uh, this particular collection mm -hmm. and how it connects to specific historical topics and such. Uh, thank you. Thank you for taking the time. This is fantastic. I, awesome. I, I spent a lot of time thinking about the libraries at JHU and every time I talk to somebody who's in them, I learn things that I had no idea about. So uh, I personally, I found it very, uh, very rewarding. Great. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. 
All right, everyone, thank you again for joining us. Uh, we will continue to have these as, as we have time. And I certainly appreciate you spending part of your day with uh, those of us at Johns Hopkins University. Have a good one.